Dr. Marvin Berman is the founder and director of the Quiet Mind Foundation in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. A neuropsychophysiologist and researcher, Dr. Berman is passionate about developing and providing safe, non-invasive, non-drug treatments for people experiencing learning, memory, behaviour and movement problems caused by a range of neurological disorders, including epilepsy, traumatic brain injury, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Excitingly, he has just published a study showing that twice daily application of transcranial near infrared light stimulation significantly improved cognition in patients with mild to moderate dementia. I'm really excited to have Dr. Berman on my channel today to tell us more about the study and the possible applications of its findings. Well, thank you so very much for joining us today, Dr. Berman. I'm really thrilled to speak to you. And I know viewers will be really interested in what you have to say, actually, because this is a new study. You've just published it this month and very, very excited to um, hear more about it. So I thought we could start. Do you want to tell us what sort of light therapy device was used in the study? Well, that's great. So we can start with show and tell. Yeah, sure. So... Wow. Here's the device. Yeah. And yep. Yeah. And what it is is a uh, transcranial and intraocular 1070 nanometer transcranial light therapy device. It was developed about 15 years ago by Dr. Gordon Dougal yeah. in the UK. Mm -hmm. And it's gone through several iterations in terms of design, but this is where we are now. And um, what it's doing is putting a fairly strong beam of near infrared light directly into the brain down maybe about one to three centimeters into the cortex. Yeah. And the stimulation going in your eyes is much more powerful because it's directly stimulating the retina and the retina is part of the brain. But that this device has been in use in our clinical practice and in our research now for about 15 years. Wow. It, it looks like a really powerful device. It, is this something people can use at home or is it just... Oh, my. No. This Well, <laughs> yes, they can uh, in, in a clinical trial arrangement that we have with people. But yeah, yeah this is kind of clunky. It, it, it has a certain Darth Vader meets <laughs> Doctor Who quality. Um, and what we want, what we wanted to do, and we've been able to succeed, is in designing a device that's on our website now, that is more like a bike helmet. Okay, yeah. And it has uh, the same wavelength of light. Yep. It's not as it's not as powerful which yeah. is okay because you can extend the use, the time limit of how long you use it. Oh. But um, that, that new device allows greater control over the, uh, what they call frequency or pulse rate. And okay. the pulse rate is very important in terms of the kind of um, entrainment or mimicry that the brain will do when you present it with a certain kind of pulse. It will tend to mimic that pulse frequency. So if we know that someone's brain activity is deficient in a certain frequency yeah. in their brain, we can then put in that frequency and help boost that particular pattern of activity in that person. So it becomes a much more customized, individualized type of treatment. That is why we also sell the device with six months of our clinical and technical support. Wow. So the frequency thing, that's fascinating. So can you explain that a bit more? So are you saying that um, all the functions of our brain, like learning or memory or behavior, um, they're um, dictated by different wavelengths or, or frequencies? They are. Okay. Well, they are. And the, the, the frequencies uh, in EEG terms yeah. are the uh, brain waves that most people know about delta and theta and beta and things like that. Yeah. Well, the, all of those brain waves are occurring all the time, yeah. but the, the pattern and the connectivity 
that is going on between the different brain regions is what we're particularly interested in and why we use the quantitative EEG measurement yep. as a guidance system for how to, how to deliver the treatment. Because we think that what we found is that the light is a tissue level intervention. It's actually affecting the cells and the neurons and the tissue and the blood flow. So it's a very biological type of intervention. So it, it, it has an effect that is much more about the underlying causal factors that are driving neurodegeneration. The, 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 the EEG activity is something that you measure with a, an EEG, a brain, an electroencephalogram. Yeah. And what we do is we've seen that you can train that type of brain activity using a basic reward conditioning model. But that type of activity is what binds the different networks and parts of the brain together. So if you have some kind of dysregulation or disease process, yeah. it is absolutely going to disrupt the electrical connectivity. But if you just use the infrared light to heal and help develop the, the health of the brain, that's not necessarily going to give you the optimal resolution of the problem because you haven't renormalized the connections. So we tend to advocate using the light in conjunction with biofeedback brainwave biofeedback training and all of that can be done at home it's it's really interesting um and and you so that makes sense because i when i read your study it was um also the, the short application of it it was twice daily for six minutes but Correct. you're saying this device you used is very powerful more powerful than a home use device so if you use the you might, home, yeah so you might home, use it for you might use it for 12 minutes yeah that does, maybe 15 yeah, that does make a lot of sense. And the biofeedback that you might do on a daily basis or as frequently as you want, really, yep. that is something you might do for 15 or 20 minutes as well. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me a bit more specifically then in the trial. So you have someone with mild to moderate dementia and they're right. struggling with um, maybe certainly short term. Short-term short, memory. Short-term memory, yep. So then you're giving this light stimulation. What's what's happening over the weeks? Like, what are you seeing? They're, they're starting to remember things better? Well, certainly when, when we did the clinical trial uh, with the people in Texas and here in Philadelphia, yep. we did a battery of neuropsychological tests along with the quantitative EEG. Yeah. And the, the neuropsychological tests are you know, draw a clock, that one, oh, there's, yeah. uh, there's the connecting the dots and how quickly you can connect the dots. Um, there's remembering lists of words, you know, there's those kind of things. And then there's what's called the mini mental status exam. Yep. You know, who's the president? Where do you live? Count back from a hundred and that. So those things were what we did. And what we saw by the end of week eight was that there was some somewhere between um, four and seven point difference in, in terms of improvement on the mini mental status exam. That's fantastic. And that's, that's, that's a very highly significant uh, number in the statistical measurement of pre and post change. So we were very excited by, oh, look, this is really working because we compared it against the placebo device. Yes. So we had, we had one of these where the lights didn't turn on. Sure. But but we had other, you know, the fans were going and the light little running lights were on. So nobody knew and nobody can see infrared light anyway. Yeah. You know, unless you're from another unless you're from another planet. <laughs> so with that in mind, we were able to do a very clean placebo controlled trial. And the people in the placebo group didn't significantly change in terms of the mental status exam much at all. Yeah. There was no significance at all. That's what I really find exciting about your trial because um, you did have that randomised, you did have the the, placid, yeah, the the dummy one and the real one, so you can really compare. I think that's really important. Um, and 
Yeah, and the fact part. that we did it in two different locations. Yeah, yeah, that's really good, yeah. And so if you were, um, what what's another treatment, say, to try and delay um, dementia, like, say, um, doing jigsaw puzzles or reading or, or those sorts of lifestyle therapies? If you were doing those along with the light therapy, do you think the light Certainly. therapy would just really enhance anything else you're doing? The light therapy is an intervention to actually stop the neuroinflammation and also to increase the amount of uh, brain chemicals that are associated with healthy brain activity. Yep. So this is a physiological intervention along the lines of what Dr. Bredesen does in the Recode program. Yep. So this is, this is kind of a building upon the idea of removing pathogens, toxins, you know, those kinds of things that are really interfering with normal physiological and brain function. Once you can get rid of the metal toxicity and the mold and things like that, you want to boost brain energy. That's what the light can do. It can also confer a certain amount of protection to the brain against further injury. So it's neuroprotective as well as reparative. The jigsaw puzzles and Sudoku and things like that are good exercise no no matter what but there's really a big difference between you know an actual intervention like this on a physiological level or the biofeedback where you're literally renormalizing brain connectivity so i wouldn't want to put them in the same category but they certainly work well together so in your study um light therapy was applied to the brain obviously mm-hmm. in in Parkinson's studies, we've seen um, a remote effect of light therapy, like le- light therapy being applied elsewhere on the body. Um, do you think this would have um, similar effects on, on brain activity as well? Or do you think this is really specific? You're really wanting to get the light onto that brain? Uh, I, I, I certainly support the idea that your brain is connected to every part of your body and yeah. every part of your body is connected to your brain. Yeah. So it's a it's a two way communication process, and the um, the application of light stimulation to different parts of the body has been shown to affect EEG activity. I mean, people have put people oh people have put light stimulation on their palm. Yeah. And measured the change of that frequency occurring in their brain. Oh, that's incredible. by putting their hand on a device. Oh yeah, yeah. So I mean everything's connected. Yeah. The idea of going directly to the brain again is about intervening in a way that's going to help heal the inflammation yeah. and the what what's we call hypoperfusion or lack of blood flow. Right. So those are the two bottom line issues and hypoperfusion leads to inflammation and inflammation leads to hypoperfusion. So if you can use one thing like the light therapy to correct both of those problems yeah. without any side effects and rapidly, yeah. that's, a good th- that's a good thing. Oh, a very good thing. And in fact, that reminds me of what I was going to say earlier, is that it sounds like it's working like a pharmaceutical drug, but it's not a pharmaceutical drug. It's in fact yes. an extremely safe intervention and like you said no side effects well it's a good point and um i recently was interviewed by dr bredesen on his show and one of the things i really wanted to underscore was that we were all trained right as clinicians and and psychologists and i mean all of us were trained in basic neuroscience that the neuron is in fact an electrochemical system. Right. And so anything that's going to affect the chemistry, like a, like a, a pharmaceutical, yeah. has to then affect the electrical activity. Right. Well, then going the other way has to work too. So if you change the electrical activity, you're then going to affect the biochemistry. That's, as we say here, that's the deal. <laughs> that's, 
that's true and that is really amazing it it really is it and and i i love because all the pharmaceutical interventions for parkinson's alzheimer's they 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 are pretty nasty like the side effects are, are are pretty pretty bad um for parkinson's in particular they um, yeah so for, so to have something like this that can help yeah i think it's a very it's very important and i think that the more we can integrate uh biochemical interventions yeah especially as they become more targeted yeah i think it's going to be very important to bring them together yes i think that yeah. the light therapy can uh potentiate the effect of drugs yeah i think that the the a light therapy and the biofeedback can also increase the percentage of people for whom the drug is in fact effective. Oh, I see synergistic effect. So, yeah, I don't think yeah, I think that there's been kind of a us against them sort of political back and forth or, or polemic. It's just not it's not useful because again, if it's an electrochemical system then we really all have to be working together synergistically to produce the best effect. Well, then we really need to put the biofeedback and the light therapy and the functional medicine together with those kinds of pharmaceutical agents that are needed to have the best the best result that's all we're looking for the best result yeah very good point it like uh, like i said i just i know a lot about parkinson's so i keep referring to that but it's exactly the same the parkinson's patients stayed on their medication but the light therapy enhanced the effects of the medication enhanced their their um symptom improvement yeah and another point is that you might you might be able to use the light therapy and the biofeedback we've seen this with parkinson's patients because we did a small study we haven't published it yet but yep. we did a small study on forearm forearm bradykinesia oh yes with the helmet yeah and we saw that people who use the hel helmet the big one for two months yep. we had them playing a whack-a-mole game okay where they had to quickly smack two pads that were set about 30 centimeters apart. Yeah. And we said, hit it as fast as you can. And we saw that people after two months were increasing their speed of being able to hit the pad and play the whack-a-mole significantly better than the people who were using the placebo. Oh, great. Oh, that's Yeah. Great. So, I mean, yeah. but that, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be taking your carbidopa levodopa. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. What, what protocol were you using in this unpublished study? Um, how many minutes of life? Unpub the unpublished one? Yeah. The Parkinson's. We, we had people coming in and doing the whack-a-mole game. Yep. We also had them uh, getting up from a chair, walking 10 meters, turn around, come back and sit down and we videotaped. Yep. And then, so we'd had each of them do each of those things three times each okay. time they came in. They yeah. did it three times with each hand yeah. and they came in three days in a row. Okay. Yep. So but, we got a, oh, got yeah, a spread. But, but and, what? Oh, the, it, it was this. It was that. Okay. Yep. It was and, this. We, and, they took it home and did it twice a day, six minutes. Twice a day, six minutes. Okay. Yep. And what wavelength is that? I think you mentioned it at the beginning. Was it one thousand? A thousand seventy. It's like a between a thousand sixty and a thousand eighty nanometers. Because that's the, on the spectrum. Yeah, sure. Because that's one thing that um, other researchers have mentioned this about light therapy and that being a challenge is that researchers in different labs around the world are using different wavelengths and different protocols, but they're, but they're still seeing really good results. So there seems to be right. a little bit of a leeway between, say, from about 890 nanometer to, what, a bit over 1,000 nanometer, that sort of... Right. Yeah. There's, there's absolutely um, the the mitochondria in the cell can absorb light between 700 and 1100. Okay. Yep. The optimal for the optimal wavelength is something that we don't really have an answer for at the moment, and I think it's you know kind of a complicated explanation about why we picked 1070 but suffice to say that the 
the penetration in the water molecule is very uh, similar at 800 and 1,070. Okay. But just because, just because their penetration is similar doesn't mean they're the same. And it doesn't mean they have the same biological impact. And Professor Paul Chizot at Durham, Durham University in the UK has done a great deal of research on the 1070 in terms of the basic biomolecular activity and the genetic activity, as well as uh, the bench science of cell line studies and animal studies. He's really worked through a lot of the detail about how the 1070 really works. Okay. So we've been very fortunate to have him as a, a colleague helping us, you know, to navigate the, the, the you're right, the thicket of frequencies <laughs> and wavelengths and the kind of tower of Babel that gets, I think there's, there's so much more to be understood that trying to say, oh, what's the ideal wavelength? It's not a good idea at this point. Yeah. It would, it would be, it would diminish the it would diminish the value and yep. the importance of people just using red and infrared light on their body in a in a way that is helpful and to that end i think i i keep making this point that these things are not toys and people really should take them seriously in terms of how long they use them for what way they use them and that getting professional guidance by someone who actually understands about how to use these tools and has experience is extremely important in terms of people being able to get the best best use out of it and not just posting a, a question on Facebook and you know scrolling through 35 different answers it, it's um, it, it's not a, it's not really a safe way to go and it's certainly not the most efficient way to go Yes, you, you are right, definitely. Like if, if I was struggling with a neurological disorder or one of my family members was, say, and I had a clinic similar to yours or another reputable clinic that we, was using these devices, I think that that would be the best way to go, to come in clinic, get this treatment and, and get the guidance. But unfortunately, still we're still, you know, like the, you're still right. few and far between. So people are using infrared light devices on themselves. But one... Yes. One bit of advice that, that has come from some other researchers is they're saying every second day use seems to be. So that, that again, is do you use it once a day or twice a day if you've got a... <laughs> again, it, it really, to me, it always comes back to what is the person's resilience? What is their condition? What can yeah. they tolerate? Yeah. Um, we're, very, we're very conservative about the way we go about doing the treatment but that's one of the reasons why we don't sell any of our products without providing technical and clinical support yeah. along with it. Yeah. And we've designed everything that we do so that it can be done at home. Yeah. Okay. Because, okay. you know, it, given the fact in, with dementia, there's 150 million people, yeah. right, who need to be putting this on or something like this on their head yeah uh, last month yes it, i know it's it, huge it, it, yeah it doesn't i mean people with parkinson's i mean if you add people together with dementia and parkinson's you're you're at almost 200 million people in the world yeah 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 so it's got to be done this way we have to be able to deliver the information this way through the internet but we have to do it in a way that is smart and effective and minimizes the idea of any kind of downside effects. And with light therapy, the there is a dose response curve. Yes, you can overdo it, can't you? Mm. And and overdoing it can lead to not getting any benefit because your brain says, what the heck is this? This is too much, I'm gonna shut down. And then you don't get any benefit. Do you think um, the benefits seen from, from your protocol or using infrared light therapy would quickly wear off if daily light therapy or every second daily light therapy was stopped? Or do you think there would be long-term benefits? Like, um, My answer is yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's both. It's both. Oh, yeah, yeah. So if you stop using a vitamin, you're yeah. going to lose the benefit of the vitamin. Yeah photobiomodulation is 
much more like a vitamin than it is an antibiotic. Okay. Yeah. So to that degree, if you stop using it, you're going to lose some of the benefit. Yes. However, by virtue of the fact that you've been using it over time, yeah. you are in fact healthier. Yeah. 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 I, so, <laughs> I understand. Yeah. So a bit, a bit like exercise as well. And that sort of lifestyle. Absolutely. Thing, you need to keep it up. Yeah. Yeah. And if you, and if you combine the biofeedback with the photobiomodulation, yeah. then you're renormalizing the brain activity and creating a more efficient neurophysiological system that's yep. going to be able to maintain a healthier level of functioning. Yes. Yeah. Now, your study involved participants with mild to moderate dementia. Would you consider using light therapy on those with more severe forms of dementia? With, with the understanding that time you know, time is the enemy in this situation. So the okay. longer you wait, yeah, the, le the less resources you have to affect yeah. or the more, the, the more significant changes that you can see happening may be more in terms of emotional state. Okay. Yeah. Then cognitive reversal. Okay. Sure. So yeah. we've seen people, we've seen people in the clinic who, came in in severe states of dementia, mm -hmm. but were extremely agitated and combative and having a very hard time dealing with, you know, being con contained. What we found was that the light therapy, especially when it was pulsed at around 10 Hertz, 10 times a second, that was very helpful in terms of helping somebody calm down and be able to tolerate things like the sun going down. All right. So they were able to tolerate the shift from daylight to night and, uh, and then waking up in the morning and having the light on. Those things were e more easily tolerable and their agitation was significantly reduced. One of the things to note in the study in Texas, the, the cohort in Texas had an interesting situation because they recruited subjects from the movement disorders clinic that was downstairs from the Department of Neurosurgery. Okay, yeah. So they went down there and punched in dementia into the database, but that meant that they were getting people who had Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Oh, sure. So some of the people in the study, um, their caregivers started reporting that within eight days or two weeks, they were having the experience of their loved ones coming in and helping with the dishes, oh. <laughs> smiling, smiling and talking and being more animated and not having that kind of shut down facial masking. Yeah. They were more flexible, their gait improved. And that wasn't what we were focusing on. Yeah. You know, we were focusing on their memory but their sleep improved, their mood improved, their gait improved. So again, it's a, it's a basic neurophysiological intervention that's going to improve the efficiency of how your brain is organized to function. So in a sense, when you're dealing with something that basic, if whatever the problem is, is mediated by the central nervous system, yeah. and what you're doing is making the central nervous system more efficient, What's not going to improve? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in fact, you answered my question, um, my next question, which was going to be, would you um, consider um, light therapy for all forms of dementia or just Alzheimer's? But I think you've already answered that and your study already answered that. <laughs> yeah. And I think that, we, I think that we, can, we can say that there's potential for benefit to any neurodegenerative process. Yeah, yeah. I I don't, I don't have nearly enough evidence to say, oh, this will work better with Alzheimer's than frontotemporal or there's, we're just not there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very ongoing research. This isn't it. Like it's, it's still in its infancy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we have to get, we have to get, I mean, this is kind of where, um, you know, NIH, if you're listening, we really need more funding. <laughs> 
Yeah, yes, yes. We really need more funding here in Australia too. Um, so coming back to if you were, say, a physiotherapist and you were um, prescribing exercise therapy for um, someone with dementia, the exercises were pro or someone with spinal problems, the exercises would vary a little bit. Do you think this is going to um, be similar to light therapy so that it's going to be individual for people coming in? It's going to vary a little bit in terms of the protocol and how long the light therapy is administered for? sort of similar to varying an exercise slightly? Do you think Do you think the light therapy might? I think it will. I think that the variations on the light therapy um, are going to be important to monitor, and that's why we want people yeah. to okay. stay in touch with us. Yes. Yeah. Because in the same way that a physiotherapist or a physical therapist is going to modify the exercise program yeah. as people become stronger or more flexible, they're going yep. to vary the protocol in order to improve and improve the outcome. It's exactly the same with light therapy. If we can now use the pulse frequency yep. as a way to modify the brain's response, and we know we can track how well, how, how more normal the brain is functioning using yep. the quantitative EEG measurements, then we can track and modify the protocol as we go along. Yeah. And is everyone's pulse frequency a little bit different? Like if you were comparing my pulse frequency in doing one task, would it be a little bit different to someone else's pulse frequency doing another task? Sure. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So like a heartbeat. Gonna be, yeah. Well, and, and, you know, you grew up in a different family. Yeah. You, yeah. you ate different food. Yeah. You, yeah. you know. Yeah. So that. You, yeah. you, all of that matters. It's very important research, I'll tell you what, because wouldn't it be fantastic in like five, five, ten years time if people are struggling with dementia, they they can they could go to a clinic like this and receive therapy that really is gonna make a difference, slow down the dementia, even reverse right. it a little bit. Well, that's what we're that's what we're hoping for. And I think mm -hmm. one of the one of our goals for the research is to continue to modify the technology. Yeah. so that we can incorporate the EEG into the helmet. Oh, right. Okay. So that we can, we can monitor the brain's response to the stimulation in real time. Oh, great. That'd be really useful, wouldn't it? And then we can modify, we can modify the stimulation parameters Yep. So that we're continuously improving and normalizing brain activity. Yeah, yep. So what the people in your trial, are they continuing, yep. are they continuing with their light therapy? Uh, some are, Not some nice. are, some aren't. Yeah. Some, aren't. some are and, and some aren't. Um, people make their own decisions about how they want to proceed. Yeah. And because there's no funding yeah. for continuing, you know, when we're talking about people having to purchase a device that can cost anywhere from, you know, seventeen hundred to ten thousand yeah. dollars. You know, it depends on what what device. I mean, you know, it's it's not an insignificant situation. No, no it's not. So, it, it's not at all. Yeah. Um, it's a good investment from from our perspective, um, but you know, people have the time, energy, and resources that they have, and yeah. we're a nonprofit. We're a nonprofit foundation, so we solicit grants and donations and things like that to help people who don't have resources be able to utilize these services. And mm -hmm. we're even working on creating a clinic, a free clinic in Philadelphia so that people can come and use the tools, oh, but, but they agree to allow us to do the measurements, the EEG and the other testing that we can do that kind of ongoing testing yeah. with them while they use the whole range of technologies. Oh, fantastic. and they can pay, they can pay whatever they can afford. It doesn't matter. Oh, that's great. That's really great. <laughs> Good on you. That's we'll see. We'll see.
Yeah, no, it's fantastic work. It is very, you you are so right, the cost of these devices. Um, Because people, like, say, what, what, what sort of advice would you give for now, like, um, you know, people in Australia, America, anyone who's listening to this? Or I have listeners from all countries, Philippines, um, Taiwan, uh, um, Japan, um, you know, because light therapy is being studied sure. everywhere. But if yeah, you... we can certainly... Go ahead. Yeah, if you did have, um, or or if say your your parent was was struggling with dementia and you wanted to try and help them, what sort of device or protocol would you sort of recommend as a starting point that might be sort of affordable to people? Because when you look on eBay, there are infrared light therapy devices. Oh. Are, yeah. So so what? Where would you start? Like, <laughs> I think I would. I think I would invite people to get in touch with me or people who, who have people who they can, they know have experience professionals who are working in this area yeah. who can give them a bit of, a bit of quarterbacking, a quarter, a, a bit of guidance. Yeah. You know? And that what we do that, we do that on a, on a regular basis where we do a consultation with people yeah. to just kind of get a sense of where are you, what have you got going on and then try and give them options that makes sense given their time, energy, and resources, yeah. and and don't offer them things that, that aren't going to be worthwhile or useful. And yeah. I think that, well, look, the very first thing that you have to work on yeah. is breathing. Okay. Because every physiological system in your body is tie is tied in to respiration. Right. So. One thing that everyone can start doing right now is monitoring the number of times that they breathe in one minute. Oh. The other thing is to monitor while you're breathing, how are you, how are you getting the air in? Are you inhaling through your nose or are you inhaling through your mouth? Yeah. <laughs> and to work, to work, on shifting from inhaling through your mouth to only inhaling through your nose and decreasing the number of times per minute that you're breathing and get as close to six as you can. All right, six times. Because the research, the research on respiratory sinus arrhythmia is that when you get to around six breaths a minute, you're basically getting all the systems in your body to harmonize and work together. How interesting. I probably breathe about 60 times a minute. <laughs> so while we've been having this conversation, yeah. I've been breathing in through my nose, yeah. even while I'm talking. Wow. Fascinating. So the more people can pay attention to that, the less adrenaline they're going to be injecting into their bloodstream oh. because as soon as you breathe in through your mouth, yeah. you're automatically stimulating the part of your brain that thinks there's a tiger coming in the room to eat you. <laughs> How interesting. That's absolutely fascinating. That's what I love about re interviewing researchers and doctors like yourself who know all this sort of really fascinating and useful stuff. Thank you. <laughs> that, that's great. You're welcome. All right. all right. I'll definitely take that on board. <laughs> and I, I hope your listeners take it seriously. There I are do. many, many apps. There are many apps on the phone for breathing. Yeah, I do. I do too, Hope. Yeah, definitely. I, I do as well. I, I really do think that would be very useful. Honestly, thank you. And speaking of more useful things, what, um, so light, what other conditions apart from dementia do you believe light therapy can benefit? Well, like I said, if, if whatever the disorder is, is mediated by the central nervous system. Yeah. And what you're doing is making the central nervous system function more efficiently. Yep. Kind of. You know, what's not going to improve? Yeah. Um, we have been focused on things like dementia, Parkinson's, ALS, traumatic brain injury, yeah. PTSD, yeah. you know, soldiers coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, yeah. Yeah. all of those kind of 
trauma situations. Yeah. Um, we've also worked with kids with uh, autistic spectrum disorder yeah. and seen that the light therapy significantly helps them with their mm-hmm. social contact, their eye contact, and being able to manage that hyper activation. Yeah. Yeah. So all, all of those kind of conditions can respond effectively and positively to these kinds of stimulations. Yeah. Do any do any patient stories stand out for you in your mind that you think that you've been able to really change the quality of life um, for somebody? Sure. Um, a, a teacher, this PTSD, traumatic brain injury. I mean, there was a special ed teacher who was attacked by some students in the in the lunchroom and was severely injured mm-hmm. and um, she did several years of training and treatment and has been able to regain a good a good portion of her life and she's been able to re, you know and 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 ascribes most of her recovery to using the infrared light and the neurofeedback yeah. um, kids who came in for five or six sessions of biofeedback and who were on the autistic spectrum and then went back to school and the school said, gee, I guess, um, I guess you never really had autism. We must've made a mistake in the diagnosis. Oh, right. <laughs> and the parents, the parents had not told them what we, what they were doing. Okay. But yeah. all of a sudden Johnny was different. And so the teachers were like, oh, I guess we made a mistake and you really weren't autistic to smart. Well, that's <laughs> not really true. Right. Um, there have been any number of people along those lines and stories like that all the time. Yeah. Um, but we as researchers tend to put stories in one category and yeah. evidence, you know, clinical evidence in another category. Yes. And in order to get people with letters after their name to really take this seriously, yeah. you can't really rely on the stories. No, that's but, but the listeners, but the listeners to the podcasts, they're not necessarily that interested in research design. They're <laughs> interested in, well, what happened? Did they get better or didn't they? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so it's important to be able to offer both. And we have a bunch of those stories on the website at quietmindfdn.org. We have oh. a bunch of stories, but really, you know, our focus, our focus has to be on the research and providing the evidence yeah. because ultimately what needs to happen is we need to get Medicare. We need to get the NHS to sit up and take notice. Yeah. And the only way they're going to do that is if you can come to them with 10,000 people in a study and say, look, you know, here's, here's what happened with these 10,000 people maybe you want to take a look at this because it's not 50 people, yep. you know, in Sydney, it's yep. 10,000 people across the whole country. Yes. Yes. Then, then, then they'll, then they'll sit up and go, Oh, and, and, and it only costs this much and not that much. Oh, <laughs> you mean we could save that much? Yeah. Very. That's, that's the way <laughs> you have to approach those folks. Very, very good point about the cost effectiveness, because as you know, I interviewed um, Professor Hosen Kiet about the gut microbiome being improved by infrared light therapy in his study. And what comes out through what comes from these doctors and researchers is they're saying that this is a very cost effective intervention, like it's it's going to cost less than drugs. Um, for long-term delivery, or if we do use it as synergistically with drugs, then we might be able to reduce the drug load a little bit or, um, yeah. Sure. Because once, what, once you purchase the device, that's it. That's the only cost then. Then you just... And, I mean, consultation with us would be periodic yeah. and, not, yeah. and, not that, and, not, and not expensive. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and there's also the cost of implanting electrodes in your brain. Yeah. At yeah. 50,000 50, 50, a pop. I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up because I actually had a question on my YouTube channel from another interview. A viewer asked, can this be as effective as deep brain stimulation for, actually, it was a Parkinson's question, but what, what's your opinion on it? Like, um, I think so. I think yeah. so. 
Yep. Okay. And certainly, and certainly, you're not running the risk of the wires Surgery. degrading yeah. or breaking down yeah. over a year later. Yeah. We've had people. We've had people with DBS yep. surgery come for light therapy. Oh, right. And yeah. and what happened was uh, when they used the light, yep. they could turn down the DBS. Oh, I see. They couldn't turn it off. Yep. But they could turn it down. Down. Yep. Yep. So. Very interesting. And and actually, I wanted to ask you too, are you seeing increased acceptance of light therapy amongst the scientific and medical community? You're seeing it growing? Yeah. The more, the more, yeah, the more people like, the more the foundation is able to publish, yep. the more other people are able to publish and publish solid, well-designed, peer-reviewed kind of evidence. Yep. Yeah, that because that's what the medical community should be paying attention to. Yes, yes, you are right. You do have a point. We, we do need those trials. We do need the randomized trials. Well, I'll, I can give you an example. Um, yeah. The chairman of psychiatry at Temple University some years ago yeah. was interviewed on a, for a newspaper article about the biofeedback and neurofeedback for ADHD. Okay. And he's an international world expert on ADHD. And yeah. he said, well, I don't really know much about it because I haven't really seen much research on yep. ADHD using neurofeedback. So yep. I, call, I called him when I saw the article and I said, how many inches of research would you like me to send you? <laughs> right. And he said, well, as a matter of fact, I'm flying to Sydney tonight, to, uh, no, tomorrow, and I'll have 18 hours on the plane to read. So Beautiful. send me what you have. And I said, okay. And we delivered a, a package of research like that. Yep. When he got back to Philadelphia, he called me and he said, by the time I got to Sydney, I had altered my slideshow. Okay. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> that, so there are, you know, there are clinicians and researchers who take the evidence seriously when it's presented, presented to them in yep. a way that makes sense. Yes. They will change their mind and operate accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. How long have you personally been working with light therapy for? How many years? Uh, I met Dr. Dougal in 2008. Yep. All right. So, so since then. Okay, great. And as a researcher, does, does this therapy... Um, does it excite you in terms of the potential of, of even developing it further? How, how far we can go with it? We have a long, we have a long way to go, but yeah. I would say that the functional medicine, photobiomodulation and uh, neurofeedback type interventions yeah. are pretty much going to constitute the next 50 to hundred years of psychiatry and neurology. So yeah. What's next? Yeah. Um, in the dementia space. Well, I think that the integration of the EEG neurofeedback yep, okay. with with the photobiomodulation and the respiration, yeah, and yeah. respiration and heart rate, yep, yep. So yep. we're very interested in seeing how we can combine those things. Yeah, sure, yeah. And if you're a patient or if you're a person out there listening to this, um, struggling with early. Um, diagnosis or a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, would you mm -hmm. recommend that they give this therapy a go? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I certainly would. And certainly um, the children of parents who yep. they're seeing as beginning to struggle yeah. or show symptoms, yep. I think for the children to get in touch with us and talk about what might be their options yeah before things before things get worse yes yeah because yeah. really the, the whole issue is that time is the enemy yeah yeah so the sooner people and and the thing that the thing that i i always you know want to reinforce is that when people start noticing symptoms of dementia mm -hmm. the problem has been already occurring and the the, the disease process has been ongoing 
for 10 to 15 years before people start calling it mild cognitive impairment or earlier moderate dementia. People with early to moderate dementia have been undergoing you know, destructive processes in their body for 10 to 20 years. Yeah, yeah. So it's very important to be able to catch what's going on earlier. And okay. one of the things we want to be working on now is how do we, how do we use things like the uh, optical computerized tomography, the oh. picture that you can take when you go to the ophthalmo ophthalmologist? Yeah. When, yeah. when they take a picture of your retina, yeah. You can take, you can analyze the beta amyloid load in the tissue of your retina. And from that, you can predict the onset of symptoms 10 to 15 years ahead. Oh, wow. So it's a biomarker. Like. Just from a picture. How it's definitely a biomarker. How fascinating. I, I really didn't know that. That's, that's incredible. So people could be doing that. People could be doing that right now. Yeah, yep. And finding um, out where they're at. Yeah, and and I was going to ask you, at one point, um, at the early stage, do you think that light therapy may be able to stop the disease, stop the progression of the disease? Do you think it would be possible? S signif significantly. Okay, wow. It can make a significant difference. Difference. But yep. again, it's the light therapy done in very close monitoring consideration with what's going on with that person and yes. their overall biological psychological physiological environmental all of those factors have to be taken into consideration and then you can start making predictions of with some benefit with some meaning yeah you know, sure. yeah to, to just spitball we don't we don't want to work like that Yes, no, <laughs> that's so not going to get you there. If we have all that data, if we have all that kind of information about someone, yep. we can then make some reasonable predictions about, hey, if you do this, this, and this, you might not only change the slope, you might actually reverse. And that's what the RECODE program and other programs involved in functional medicine, they've been showing that for years now. That's why we're partnered with Apollo Health yeah, which is Dr. Bredesen's company. We've we've aligned ourselves and we're partnering with Apollo Health to market his program and what they're trying to do with functional medicine and adding the photobiomodulation and neurofeedback services. So yeah, we're we're very excited about that, and I think that much much better results are in in the offing. Fantastic. That's really exciting and, and really offers hope for the future, I think, because yeah, yeah, like, yeah. like you said, dementia is a terrible crippling disease that affects millions it, and millions. Mm. Yeah. I, I mean, I, my mother and my grandmother both suffered and I had to watch that. And I think that motivated me to get into studying this kind of a problem, which is not an unusual thing for researchers in the field. Yeah. Um, I would say that everything we're talking about has relevance to the caregivers. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Of who, course. Yes. Because we, we advocate very strongly for them to use these tools yeah. themselves in order to stay sane yes. in the process of dealing with and being, being, you know, a helpful caregiver. Oh, do you mean actually using light therapy as well? Absolutely. Um absolutely. I was going to ask. We, yeah. we, we recommend that more than strongly. <laughs> yes, I, I was actually going to say that, that can it, can it um, help even a brain that isn't showing any sort of symptoms at all? Like, like say, if I wore one every day, like it would surely give some benefit or every second day or <laughs> if I had a helmet. The, well, <laughs> the reality, Suvi, is that we're, as researchers and, and neuroscience people, we can't use words like prevent yep. until we can use words like treat. Yes, yes, yeah. So That's now true. we can use, we can start talking about prevent because yep. we've now shown that we can treat. Treat, that, sure. That's how it works. That's yep. how it has to work. Yeah. So I'm very, I'm, you know, I'm very clear that this is a preventative strategy. Yeah. But 
you only get to talk about it being a preventative strategy when you've actually been able to do something with people who are showing symptoms. That's great. That's really great. That's how it works. I do have a handy pulse laser here at home. I've got a little, and it does emit infrared light, and I certainly use it on my joints um, for pain. I've, I've started using it on my abdomen now after that study came out showing that it can improve our gut microbiome. Um, mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I am a big believer in, in light therapy. And, in in fact, our, um, our dog, um, French Bulldog, is having surgery at the end of this week. And a lot of studies have come out showing that application of infrared light therapy can prime your body to recover better after surgery. So I'm, I'm giving it to him every second day. Vets use it there on. Are pa- there, are papers, there are papers coming out regularly now about people mm-hmm. using it to recover from exercise. Athletes yeah, are using yeah. it to recover from exercise. Well, sure. Yeah, yeah. But like you said, when we're talking about this, you know, the really serious conditions like dementia, you, we need to get that right protocol, that that support, that that real um, clinical application of it to probably make right. the but, difference. But the young young people are using it for neurohacking and biohacking yeah. to improve improve their performance. Yeah. And we've we use it with executives, we use it with athletes. Yeah. to enhance their enhance their performance. I think that the more people can reach out to Quiet Mind Foundation and yeah. to organizations like Apollo Health yeah. and uh, there's a company in the in in Ireland and in Germany called Neuronic Medical oh. Devices. Okay, I'll put a there's, link on the um, Yeah, and Neuronic the people at Neuronic in Ireland and in Germany are promoting the new technology that we've been developing based on the research device. Sure. Okay. Yep. Well, I'll put links. So I'd be happy to. Yeah, we should definitely do the link. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll put links down so that people can try and find as much information as possible. And I'll put a link to your published paper. And Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And absolutely. to the foundation. And so people can know where to go for help. <laughs> Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. You're a legend, Dr. Berman. Thank you for your work. And thank you for being so progressive and for sharing this really genuinely fascinating and and exciting information um, with us. And um, keep going with your great research. It's it's we will. We will. Well, maybe we can do this again and do part two sometime down the road. Oh, absolutely. I'll be very happy to interview you whenever a study comes out, whenever you've got new information, because it's an ongoing thing. So, um, okay. Thank you so much for your time and you have a good night over there. You too. (laughs) See ya. Bye.